Hi, this is What's Happening. My name is Sandy Baird, a local citizen of Burlington, like all of our, well, not all of our colleagues live in Burlington, but they live in the great state of Vermont. And I'm with Mark Estrin and Kurt Maida uh, and Pete Garitano, and all of us are observers of the present state of the world. Ian Stokes. What? And the great Ian Stokes. Stokes. And the great Ian Stokes, who is our technician. Thank heavens for him. Um, and anyway, we are here to talk about what's been happening the past couple of weeks. And I guess I will start today because um, I noted yesterday was Hiroshima Day. I don't know whether it's a day that we want to celebrate, but it is the day that for the first and only time in the history of the world that a, an atomic bomb was dropped on two densely populated cities in Japan by the United States. And that was in Hiroshima and then second in Nagasaki. Destroying, I heard yesterday, 140,000 lives with one bomb. It virtually ended World War II. I believe the rationale for it given by our then president, Harry Truman, a Democrat, was that we needed to do that so that the United States did not have to invade Japan. A lot of controversy about that. Uh, that was the official narrative. I think we all should commemorate this day, not celebrate it, but remember that it was, it, had, it was the first and only time that any country has ever dropped an atomic bomb on anybody, but in this case on densely populated cities. A very controversial thing to do. Many people feel that it was a war crime. It certainly changed the nature of war forever, but no other bomb has been dropped at this point, atomic bomb on anybody. It was the United States who did it first, and hopefully the only time it will ever happen again. Okay, so anybody else have anything to say? Ian? Yeah, well, well yeah, yeah. Um, um, the, uh, and those weapons are still with us, and, right. and in a sense it seems that they're being kind of normalized. I mean, now there are, I, I don't know, I've lost count, maybe eight countries that have nuclear weapons. At least one won't admit to it. Um, if you have, it used to be if you had nuclear weapons, you could sit on the Security Council of the United Nations, but that, that's gone by the, the wayside. But, you know, there's talk of tactical nuclear weapons, there's talk in the US of testing new designs of weapons, there's um, the failure of the, um, the missile um, con uh, agreements between the US and and so not the Soviet not Union anymore, Soviet well, so now, now with Russia. Um, and, and those um, negotiations about possibly restarting those, uh, it is the START agreement and others, I think, um, they're being um, held uh, accountable to, by the uh, United States anyway to whether China would join those agreements. But uh, I mean, that would make three out of however many eight countries that possess weapons. So I, I, I guess the point is that, um, you know, we're still living with these weapons. Right. There are um, issues that need to be addressed still to make sure that they never get used and that they don't um, propagate any further. Any, anyone? Yeah, I'd, I'd like any? to make, Mark, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a little refinement on what Sandy said. Um, first of all, the, there were, can you hear me? I don't. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima, on Hiroshima and on Nagasaki were not the same bomb. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the bomb, it's rather much more interesting to understand why there were two uh, bombings. And the Hiroshima bomb was uh, a uranium bomb that was based on a, what, what is, you know, was a, a rather simple design where you simply fired a piece of uranium into another piece of uranium and together the pieces in close proximity and sort of crushed together made for critical mass and it exploded. Um, and if people don't understand that, all, all that that means critical mass is that each of these uh, gives off neutrons and when the neutrons start piling up uh, sufficiently because enough are brought in close proximity, uh, you get, that makes for uh, energy, an energy release. 
uh, the Nagasaki bomb was an entirely different um, animal. And um, it was almost the death of the Manhattan Project because people, there wasn't a, enough uranium around to do a lot of bombs and it looked like uh, plutonium, the, 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 the Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb. Mm. And um, it looked like that would be the way to go, but they couldn't get it to work. Why? Because when plutonium got to be fired down the same path of uranium in, the, in that bomb design, it pre-detonated because it gave off, a, as it was coming down, it was coming down in a cloud of neutrons that plutonium was putting out. Mm -hmm. And so you got this little pre-detonation that uh, reduced the yield, the explosive yield of the weapon. And that almost closed down the Manhattan Project because it took a breakthrough to figure out a design entirely different from the gun barrel design of the uranium bomb. Right. And um, so there was a whole question, this is very interesting and complex engineering that went into this. And, um, but um, basically that second design needed to be tested. Ah. And so there had to be a second explosion. Right. And there had to be, we're using this other, and this, the, the, um, um, this bomb was called Fat Man, right. because the design of the plutonium bomb was much more spherical because all the, the, the um, expo explosive sort of lenses were compressing a sphere in the middle of this uh, circle. And um, so Fat Man needed to be tested in situ. In, in, uh, and, that's, and that's the only reason why, I mean, the uranium bomb itself over Hiroshima, which probably also wasn't needed to, to end the war because we have lots and lots of documents, mm -hmm. especially now that the Japanese were ready to surrender right. and that the only issue was the status of the emperor and that that could have right. been dealt with easily and that the whole business about we needed the bomb to end the war uh, was simply bullshit, you know, government yeah. bullshit. It was and also a show to, uh, to the uh, Soviet Union of our yeah. newly acquired strength. Exactly, but still that could have been done with uh, the uh, uranium bomb and also it turns out that there was, a, 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 you know, that the uh, uh, Soviets were onto this whole thing. I mean, it's sort of obvious uh, to a nuclear physicist that if you bring enough critical mass together, and that was shown in 1941, uh, that when Fermi did his pile at mm -hmm. the University of uh, Chicago, right under the uh, football stadium there, uh, that you could do that, that you would bring a critical mass together and get release of energy of uh, in, in, in Fermi's case and in that situation, experimental mm -hmm. situation, a controllable release because he would put yeah. cadmium rods into the pile to absorb the neutrons, but that you could do that. So after the, uh, 1941, December of 1941, it was clear that this was doable, but it was also theoretically clear before that to yeah. any kind and, of... And the, um, Ian has a question. Well, yeah. there was, I, I, well, I, yeah, I understand that at the time there was discussion about whether it was the, the correct thing to do was to drop these two bombs within the same week of each other on highly populated areas in Japan, or the alternative would be um, explode a bomb in some unpopulated, minimally populated area, and, and that would scare the daylights out of everybody, the Japanese, the Soviet Union, everybody else. I thought it, it had been tested. Hadn't it been tested prior to that? Had it, been it, it, yeah, I mean, in the the uranium bomb was tested in Alamogordo, but right. uh, I I didn't. I was going to ask Mark a question. How come the uh, the, the uranium bomb was the uranium bomb was never Mark, tested? Mark Kurt had a question. But yeah. I just yeah, he's he he's answering. Thing. Okay. What was tested at Alamogordo was the plutonium bomb. Okay, the uranium so. bomb didn't have to be tested. 
it was clear theoretically that it would work. And okay. what, so, so that was the big thing about Alamogordo. Would it work or not? And if it worked, what would the energy release be? Okay. Mm. All right, but well, anyway, was... you had a question. You were going to ask something. Me? Yeah. No, no, you said. Uh, I I, no, Kurt, question. I think, answered, asked his question. Didn't you, Kurt? Or do you have Yeah, no, Mark, Mark just answered it. Yeah. Okay. My question was historically, in that historical context, because it has been asserted over and over and documented that the Japanese were ready to surrender anyway, or had been communicating to the United States that they were about to surrender or would surrender, and that Harry Truman did this primarily, as Kurt said, to a tip-off to the Soviet Union and to keep the Soviet Union at bay. I think it happening in 1945, at a time when the Soviet Union and when uh, Asia, much in Asia, looked like there was going to be a communist victory, for instance, in China. Um, that was one thing. The second thing was the Soviet Union was in pretty much in command of all of Eastern Europe by then and occupying Eastern Europe, so that Harry Truman probably was already plotting, as was Roosevelt, as some kind of a way, how are we going to control the Soviets? How are we going to control the communists in Asia? Um, and then this became sort of a warning to the communist, I guess, nation, not nations at that time, but to the communist movements, that if you do this, if you, that they became the new enemy at that time. And this was a way to say, this is what we have against you. It, it was the opening so, shots of the Cold War, wasn't it? It wasn't so much a warning as it was a strategy yeah. to end yeah. the war before right. the Soviets got involved in the Pacific War. Right, right. Because, right. If, because as, the, as happened with the European War, there was a lot of claim, Soviet claim, to, um, you know, this is now our territory. But to Korea in the, particular. Yeah, the, the, right. the Soviets and the Russians, you right. know, now they, they do have this ongoing uh, dispute with Japan over, I right. think they're called the Sakhalin Islands. Sakhalin Islands, yes. That are, you know, uh, populated now, uh, oddly enough, by a mixture of Russian and Chinese, uh, and I'm sorry, Japanese people. And uh, the Soviet Union declared war, I think, on Japan right after the Nagasaki bomb was dropped. Yes, but that was encouraged by the United States. The United States wanted the Russians to come in at that point against the Japanese also. So, I mean, all I, as I understand history, that is also what happened. But then the atomic bomb was like a warning to them, don't go too far in a way. And the, and the initiating fight, the initiating struggle began with the Russians in the Cold War. And that that's, it's ongoing. It's ongoing right now. I with the Russians now, not the Soviet Union. I think another important, you know, point just to make uh, in terms of the humanitarian scale of these weapons is that for close to twenty years after the uh, the bombs, the two bombs were dropped on Japan, uh, Americans had very little visual footage that yeah. was uh, available to them to see what the effects of these bombs were. And, largely until I think there was a, a book by an author named John Hershey, I think nearly two decades after mm. the dropping of the bombs that really illustrated, you know, the, the amount of devastation that individuals in those two cities actually experienced. Right. Um, so there was a fair it, amount of it, censorship. It's hard to get around. I mean, the argument has always been that this was a war crime. I don't even think that it's an argument. How couldn't it have, I mean, there was no necessity to do this. Well, right? I mean, there was, there was a tremendous amount of footage of what, was ha what had right. happened in the concentration camps uh, that was available to Americans to see, you know, right after the Second World War. But with respect to the, uh, the dropping of the, right. uh, the, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was a fair amount of censorship that, you know, precluded Americans from being able to actually have you know, a sense of visually what happened as a result of dropping the bombs. It wasn't just, uh, you know, a gigantic explosion, you know, but uh, people were scarred, you know, uh, and there were, there were radiation sickness, cancers that, you know, continued for, for decades after the dropping of those bombs. I think the difference between atomic uh, weapons, nuclear weapons, and 
<laughs> if you want to call them traditional weapons. I don't know if there's anything traditional, for instance, about the firebombing of German cities. Uh, however, well, even, even the firebombing of Tokyo resulted right. in more deaths than right. the individual dropping of the two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But, is it, but isn't the key difference is that with atomic bombs or nuclear weapons, its nature is poisoned forever or for a very, very long time. Radiation exists, radiation causes cancers. And so I mean, there, there's no, as far as I can see, very little healing that even can be done about with nuclear weapons. Did you want to say something, Pete? Or yeah, I, Ian, I, Ian? To... I, I okay. have, go ahead, Mark, I'll talk after you. No, I just want to, the, the idea that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the only time that uh, nuclear weapons were used is a little bit yeah, slippery. Yeah. Because, right, I understand. Because oh, the the um, the shells of tank penetrating uh -huh. and in uh, general right. high penetrating armaments are made from depleted uranium. Exactly. Depleted yeah. Uranium is an alpha emitter, emitter, and so slowly puts out alpha particles. And that in the in the uh, environment of or any kind of war environment, even if you're not using, quote, atomic bombs, you are suffering from the radiation issues right. that the process brings up. Right. And, and the Iraqis, or Iraqis brought that up after the uh, Battle of Fallujah, right. that there was a fair amount of contamination yeah. at the battle site. And that's there. radioactive contamination. Right. right. I, I think there were even, uh, even rumors that the uranium tip bullets were used in our firing range in Underhill, if I'm not mistaken, in this state. Um, but I, I understand that there is still that uh, you know, nuclear weapons or nuclear, whatever, uranium tipped weapons are still in use. But the other thing they also seem to understand is there is uh, the most nations have given up the idea of ever using nuclear weapons first, except the United States has not given up that. But anyway, well, Pete wanted to talk. Pete, make, well, well, Pete, well, Pete, Pete. make the distinction between. Well, Pete wanted a question, I no, think. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Um, yeah, Mark. Uranium is a very common mineral, it's mm -hmm. a rock. It's in the ground, and um, it's probably in your basement. So uranium itself yep. is not the issue. There are, in order to m make what's called, clearly what's called weapons grade uranium, there are two types, there are two um, isotopes of uranium. One is U-235, mm -hmm. uh, atomic weight and one is U-238. U-238 is generally what's in the ground. The very little bit of it, 0.7% uh -huh. of what you get in the ground is U-235. And in order to make a, a weapon, weaponized uranium, you have to get rid of the 99.3% and concentrate the 0.7% of U-235. This is very difficult to do. Uh -huh. Usually the way you separate things is in a centrifuge and the weights are very similar so that, you know, uh, uh, it, it's just a, not a, a, it's right. a very difficult separation. And that was one of the big problems in the Manhattan Project on the uranium side of it, uh, which, was, which, which took place in Tennessee and uh, yeah. uh, the plutonium side of it took place in the Washington uh, state uh, to separate out U-235. So it isn't, uranium itself is mm -hmm. not the issue. It's what happens when you try to get the U-235, when you achieve getting the U-235 out, separated from U-238. Okay, okay. Oh, And so this is at the center of, okay. of another consequence, which is the purification of, of uranium in, in Iran. And uh, I gather that just this following coming week that our friend Elliot Abrahams, who has quite yeah. a history term, yeah. is going to go to the United Nations to extend the sanctions against um, right. 
um, Iran. So that's another, you know, another way that nuclear weapons or the potential of them is still with us. The other part of the story, Mark, is that uh, you talked about the uranium bomb and the plutonium bomb. Of course, not many years after came the hydrogen bomb, right. and the hydrogen bomb is hugely more powerful than the, um, the certainly the ones that were dropped on Japan. So the destructive power was was huge in on those two cities in Japan. It would be even greater if a hydrogen bomb was was used. Hey. And the difference between those bombs hey. is that the uranium hey. bomb and the plutonium bomb are fission bombs. Mm -hmm. And the hydrogen bomb uses as part is a fusion bomb. The hydrogen bomb is putting hydrogens together to make tritium and using an, an atomic bomb inside that bombshell to, to make the explosion, to bring that uh, fusion together and to make it hot enough for that fusion to take place. Okay, so, Pete has had a question mark. Excuse me, no, you had a comment? Go ahead. Well, two things. One thing that's always kind of gotten me is, of course, the United States is always uh, going on and worrying about Iraq's going to get nuclear weapons, and not Iraq, Iran's going to get nuclear weapons, North Korea's going to get nuclear weapons, their leaders are crazy, and you just never know that they're going to use them in, and like we've mentioned, that we're the only ones that were ever crazy enough to drop a nuclear bomb, okay? But nobody's ever said that, you know, like, like that Truman was crazier than any of these guys because he actually did it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I always think is kind of funny when we talk about other leaders being cr they're crazy and they might drop a bomb. The other interesting thing I think that this ushered in, besides the power struggle, was wars in the past um, mainly killed combatants. And this has changed over time. And I, I read something where war, World War I, like only 10% of the people that were killed were not actually warriors. They were you know, like women and children and just side casualties. And that has slowly gone up over the years. Well, this was the first time ever that there was a mass, we're just killing everybody, and it wasn't a combatant issue. It was just wipe people out. But then this kind of, really ushered in. Wait, wait, Mark. Go ahead. This, this kind of ushered in this thing, which, which we then followed through with our the Iraq wars and just, just bombing the hell out of innocent people. And it wasn't about combatants. It wasn't about the crazy leader or the warriors. It was just, let's just kill a bunch of people. I'm not saying it hadn't been done before, but this is the first time the United States in mass, I mean, literally killed probably 95% of the people were non-combatants that we killed with the bombs. Well, there were the fire bombs of World War II over the German cities, but I, and those were all civilians also. But um, I think that you're right. There was just no way that the destruction in Japan could have been considered, in my mind, against combatants. It was against the cities, before. densely populated cities of Japan. And but that anyway. came, and that was courtesy of a guy named Curtis LeMay. Right, right. And it was right. a general strategic, strategic bombing. That was the name of it. Right. Uh, as opposed to, uh, to uh, targeted bombing. Strategic bombing was taking out whole cities and whole right. populations, and the guy who ran that through, uh, the Air Force general who ran that through was Curtis LeMay, yeah. and Curtis LeMay's ideas, anyway, were what created uh, Strangelove. The character of Dr. Strangelove uh, was modeled yeah. on the ideology of Curtis LeMay, who who started this idea of strategic bombing, just take the whole, wipe the whole thing off and the everybody, earth. Has everybody seen that movie among all of us? I've seen it a, a million times. I think you recently showed it again, Mark, didn't you someplace? It, it will, this coming Thursday, well, well it's, it's available now free, I believe, uh, on, if you go to, to the uh, VTIP site, Vermont yeah. uh, International Film Festival, it's part of this series and I'm going to be talking about Strange Love uh, on Thursday, this coming Thursday. On a Zoom thing. On yeah, what? It, yeah, I guess it's a Zoom, yeah. which you can get into and participate in mm -hmm. uh, if you go through the VTIF yeah. uh, Vermont International Film right. Festival website. It's a little complex. Yeah, uh, okay. because you have right. to. Quote, buy a ticket and all of that, but the tickets are free. <laughs> so anyway, there's a film series 
and you can see it now and you should see it before next thursday so yeah i've seen i have seen it a million times i love that it's my favorite thing anyway For some of the uh, cuba files uh, on this uh, panel i mean lemay also placed uh, heavy heavy pressure on president kennedy to go out and conduct an all-out war against the soviet union you know during the uh, missile missile crisis in cuba right. Well, not only an uh, all-out war against the Soviet Union, but it would have amounted to a nuclear war. Yes, which would, with, yeah. About Cuba. That, as that, well. would, have, that would be how it ended. I thought Dr. Strangelove was Kissinger. I didn't realize yeah. it wasn't. I, I thought it was Werner von Braun because it, of the he German is, accent. It is. But okay. Werner von Braun plays uh, a Nazi who came after the Second World War here. He is actually Strangelove, isn't he, Mark? No. Werner von Braun was involved only with Rocket propulsion. Right. Yeah. Right. But he's the character in Strange Love, isn't he? The, the Peter Sellers character, uh, Doctor Strange Love, has a German accent. Right. You no, know, it's a mixture of a whole bunch of things. But Werner von Braun himself was was a propulsion engineer. Yeah. And yeah. Was, uh, yeah. was the key person in the whole uh, V two. Uh, you know, end of the war, the magic weapons, the uh, uh, of Hitler that were going, uh -huh. and and was very important. And then he was obviously uh, rescued by the United States, grabbed over here, and became a very important figure in our development of, uh, of rocketry and not, and NASA. Yeah, right. And NASA. So, any other topics to be covered? This, um, I think, someone wanted in relation to that. Um, what's happening in Beirut? We mentioned Iran um, and we mentioned Beirut. I mentioned Beirut. Apparently there was a huge explosion in Beirut a couple of days ago, massive amounts of death and destruction. It has been mainly uh, discussed as an accident. So is that co correct or not? What do you think? The narrative that has been put out, but now it's that narrative is starting to break down. Was that there was a uh, there was a Russian ship about seven eight years ago, ago uh, that was uh, uh, that had headed out from a, a Black Sea seaport uh, from Georgia and was destined for Mozambique, and it stopped in uh, Beirut to pick up some additional heavy machinery to transport, and that was uh, the ship was having financial issues. And they couldn't pay the uh, the Russian and mixed uh, Ukrainian crew, so they stopped in Beirut to pick up this additional machinery to transport to Mo Mozambique. I think to Mozambique, and that would have allowed them the additional monies to pay their crew. Apparently, there was some issue with the machinery, and the ship ran into further financial problems, and they were unable to uh, pay the crew. They were unable to pay port fees in Beirut. And allegedly, the, the government of Lebanon uh, confiscated the ship uh, and put it, you know, and kept it out in the harbor. Yeah. And again, allegedly, the ship had a, a large amount of ammonium nitrate stored, about 2,700 2, tons of it. And it's been sitting out there for seven years. Uh, now, somehow it ignited and caused this explosion. Somehow. Right. That's, that's the narrative that's been put out. But uh, uh, again, a competing narrative that the uh, the president of Lebanon has just put out today is that they're they're also looking into potential external uh, like, causes, like a bomb. Well, they're saying external causes that may okay. have set off this uh, this uh, ammonium ammonium nitrate storage on this ship. Uh, Sixteen okay. people were taken into custody. Uh, just in the right. last 20 But I hours. thought those people were Lebanese who may be accused of negligence. Is that correct or not? No, this is, I mean, this is a criminal investigation. This is not simple negligence. Right, okay. All right. Anyone else have any well, thoughts? Yeah, yeah on that, um, <clears throat> this explosion was actually uh, involved about 10 times more ammonium nitrate than the, the one in, in Oklahoma City that um, brought down a federal building some years ago. Actually, that was, I think that was nitrate mixed with diesel fuels, but it was, um, you know, that, that was a very destructive bomb that was, um, in, you know, a lot smaller than the one in Lebanon. But the, um, I think there are two important questions about um, 
the the explosion in in Beirut. First one is why was the cloud that rose from the explosion right. such bright orange? So that implies right. there was some other chemical or, or explosive involved. And and then the other one which Kurt was really pointing to is the um, you know you can have this stuff sitting in a warehouse for what was it seven years or more? Seven years. And and so what? what triggered the explosion right. and that of course is very difficult to determine so yeah still unknowns even even if we accept the whole narrative about the um the, sh the cargo on the ship being stored in an i mean i guess on say uh -oh. yeah we lost you in can you Ian, we lost you. Are you? Oh, oh, I, I, I just turned off my microphone. I'm, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I wanted to say something. It's interesting to me that there's always an ongoing war in Lebanon, um, and I don't think Americans at all, and I don't either, uh, understand the nature of that war. But I will say that I work in the um, in the African Association here in Vermont. And when I when we were talking about this with Africans, and when I talked about it with them, the Beirut thing, both of them said it was an attack. Now that has not been the narrative anywhere here. Um, and although Trump initially said it was an attack, didn't he? So does he know anything or is he uninformed about this? Is there any possibility that this was an act of war against Lebanon? I mean, there have been other attacks on Lebanon, and the accusation is, is that Lebanon has, I guess, terrorist groups within Lebanon, correct? Or Hezbollah oh. is within Lebanon, that's been accused of being a terrorist group or an ISIS group. Is there any uh, thought among any of you, or have you seen anywhere that this could have been an attack on Lebanon? There is well, only I'll tell you one. What? what, Pete, Pete, go ahead. Um, my thought is that we've discussed this before, certainly Mark would say this, there's very few accidents, and this is a big accident. And so if I was the king or what, what, the Lebanon, who, what, is he a prime minister? President, president. President. If I was the president of Lebanon, the first thing I would su suspect is some kind of sabotage. The difficulty is there's probably 20 different groups of people who are all like what they would consider radical people that might do this. So it's probably a pretty tough thing to try to figure out whether it could be the Mossad, it could be the CIA, it could be 18 other groups of people that were said, hey, look at this, there's a bomb inside of this building. All we have to do is ignite it. We don't even have to make a bomb, you know, and that's what it is. I mean, it's the stuff sitting there, but right, the fertilizer is, since Oklahoma City, we've all learned, I didn't know before that, that fertilizer is pretty close to being a, a, a bomb, you know, with, and I don't really know how it's ignited, to tell you the truth. But so it's your though it's your opinion, I think, Pete. Then that there's no coincidences, no, no real. This is a big accident. Yeah. I mean, and I agree with Ian that that cloud that came above that thing. I mean, maybe that's just what happens when you have that much uh, fertilizer. I don't know. There's uh, only one uh, person that I've seen online. Uh, um, who talks about something that's rather uh, an obvious thing to talk about anyway, not necessarily the case, which is uh, the, the, uh, the question of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, who has, you know, had a long-term uh, destructive relationship uh, with Lebanon. They, 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 were, they invaded the country, they invaded Lebanon in 1982, and occupied it until uh, 2000, and then there was a war with Hezbollah in 2006. So, you know, in Israel has been attacking Lebanon. Uh, and Syria, and Syria, right? But this is, we're talking yeah. about Lebanon. And, and so mm -hmm. you, if you ask the Kui Bono question, who right. benefits from this? Uh, it's very interesting to me that nobody <laughs> except Richard Silverstein on his blog uh, has suggested that, you know, who benefits from it is Israel. And um, uh, Israel itself has had a rather interesting reaction. They, of course, uh, have denied it. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Nothing to do with it. Uh, and they want to send aid to Lebanon, uh, medical and technical aid 
and uh, to uh, work with the survivors. And they put up this, uh, it's a wonderful photograph of, they lit up the whole side of the um, uh, Capitol building with an, an, an Lebanese flag, the windows, like, uh, you know. In just, Israel? In Israel? Israel, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, all of this is very non-typical. Um, of the way, you know, Israel usually celebrates its victories and um, they don't celebrate and offer to aid and all of that. So maybe that's what has discouraged people from discussing their disability. Uh, but, uh, but now I'm getting- But, but, the, getting... but is, it, is it true or not that for years, well, this is, this is what one theory that I saw was that Israel would has been also lobbing blows recently at Iran itself, right? In Through its in cyber stuff, right? Is that correct, Ian? Neither confirmed nor denied, 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 which means that you never really know. But Israel and the United States seem absolutely committed to uh, having at least regime change in Iran, right? And Syria. Is that, what? And is that, Syria. And they okay. probably like it in Lebanon. Yeah, that's what I mean. But they also, both countries, accuse Lebanon of harboring terrorist groups, correct? With, like um, Hezbollah. With, I mean, they have said Hezbollah is a terrorist group, right? Uh, and with support from, supposedly, I mean, I think evidently from Iran, so there's a connection between okay, Lebanon so, and Iran. So that policy then um, would seem that what both our country and Israel seem intent on at least hurting Iran big time. So these groups within Lebanon are also considered pro-Iran, right? Yes. And in Syria too, right? But, but Sandy, I, I mean, I have a question, but if by targeting a ship that was out in the harbor, I mean, this isn't necessarily a strategic or surgical strike against Hezbollah. I mean, no, I know. you know, unless Hezbollah's headquarters happen to be next to the ship. Uh, so, I mean, what, what would, what would it, is would it be mean her, it, well, by having- it's certainly, it's going to probably destroy a lot of Lebanon at this point, right? Yeah, but not necessarily the targets that they would, the, the, you know, the usual targets, right? I don't know. I mean, I don't it, know it that. seemed, the explosion seemed relatively, you know, in terms of the damage, it was relatively indiscriminate. Right, except that Lebanon is in really bad shape, obviously the whole country. So, but I mean, is right? this the typical thing where, you know, they want, because there have been protests now that have gone on in Lebanon the na last couple of yeah. days, to have the you know the government step down, you know, there was right. a, the a Lebanese Lebanese people actually put out a, p a petition. I wonder who put this out that Lebanon should be reclassified as a French mandate, and they got 50, 58 thousand people to sign it. Well, I bet the uh, French don't want it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, Macron is there, but yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, just, I just don't know. I don't. But is, I have no is the hope like like in Cuba, like in so many other places that? the Lebanese people are going to rise up and overthrow the government? I don't know. All I'm saying is it seems like a very big attack on Lebanon itself. And again, who benefits from that is, the, is a key question. And I guess we'll have to see as it goes along. But as Pete said, and Mark, I don't believe there are many accidents of this magnitude, yeah. magnitude in history. I really don't, but maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, so... Um, I think also, does anybody else have anything? I think Pete had a little report on COVID, didn't you, Pete? <sighs> well, I mean, I, I read government stuff every day, and it's, I think we all, some of us- Wait, government know. stuff, U.S. government stuff, U.N. No, well, what? Government stuff. WHO or C CDC, their latest guidelines or changes in their guidelines. And it's just, I mean, they're, it's, it's funny because they're just all over the place, you know, and and some of the things that are very frustrating, I actually have a, I'm gonna have a conversation with the 
director of COVID from the Vermont Health Department today. She wants to talk with me on the phone because I asked like three important questions of her. And for some reason, she didn't want to email me back, but I'm glad that she's, she's calling me because I'm going to have a conversation with her. Um, but it, it's just funny, you know, they make statements, of course, they made the statement a couple months ago, absolutely don't wear a mask, mask don't do you new go, don't put a mask on, then we went to mask. Well, now today, they're waffling on testing people and aren't sick, which has been one of my arguments. Why would you mm -hmm. go in to be tested if you're not sick? So they're saying now, well, don't, yeah, you, if you're not sick, if you don't have symptoms, don't go in and get the test. So, and then part of this thing, which came across, I think it was WHO, was that they're saying now, if you haven't had symptoms, either if you were symptomatic or asymptomatic positive, and it's been seven days since you had symptoms, you're okay. You can go out and be with other people. You're probably not contagious. You don't have to get another test. So this is like a dramatic turnaround from what they said a month ago. So basically what they're saying now is you're cured, which is mind boggling to me, but it's just a whole lot. And, and Mark and, and people who were studying 9-11, there's just a whole lot of bad science going on right now. And that's my frustration is reading this stuff and you're just like, oh my God, you know, what are you talking about here? I mean, you know, you were saying you, this thing is scary and super infectious, and now you're saying it's not really scary or super infectious. So, and then you, it, there's just so much stuff like that, like pretty much daily that comes out that, that is just, it's very confusing. You know, there, were, there was one yesterday in the New York Times, which is just typical bad science reporting, where the South Korea did a study that asymptomatic people were contagious. Well, I read this thing three times, and there's not one thing in there that says that has any good science about their their study. It's like the kookiest thing who ever wrote this. It's just like rambles on and on. It throws some numbers out, but it makes no sense whatsoever. So it's it's all you know. Maybe it's that's the the thing is the people that are doing these, the reporting of the science tip aren't scientists. So they're just writers or journalists that are writing. They gave got them a story and say, here you write on this today. So they don't do a good story, or they're trying to confuse people. I don't know. Yeah, I want to. I mean, how something. long did it take before we kind of got a handle on you know what caused you know the HIV virus to spread and turn into AIDS? It's I I mean as a as a school kid in the '80s, I felt like there were a number of years before we had an idea how the that disease was transmitted. We still no. don't have an idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, look at you no. should read a book that Pete, by the way, you owe me that book back. It's Pete. it's still a lot of theory. There's a whole there's book, there's a whole book theory. that Pete gave me called Virus Mania that talks a lot about the HIV AIDS situation that everybody should read. because um, yeah, I remember it too. And I remember even thinking at the time that there was a lot of confusion, a lot of a lot of a mixed theories about it. One of which is the one that's put forward in Pete's book that states that at that time, uh, gay men in particular were involved in uh, not their sexual activity so much, but that they were using drugs which appeared to destroy their immune systems a lot. And that that was one of the reasons that of the spread or, or the AIDS situation. But I think that that book is key. And I'm, I'm asking you, Pete, where is it? It's sold out right now. I want everybody to read it. it it's at my yeah. house. I'll give it back to you. Because okay, whenever I, I see you. But I guess, I okay. mean, my, my point is just that, you know, that the novel nature of the virus, you know, uh, is leading to this confusion. And, you know, it's not an exact science because enough testing and enough uh, research hasn't been really done yet. I mean, we're about what, about eight months into this at this point, from the time when it was uh, an issue in China? But I, I guess- Yeah, but there's a lot of viruses that are new and they're gonna be a lot more. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna belabor this thing though. Yeah. After yeah. reading the book, the main thing that you get out of there is it would be, yeah, it is sometimes it's very hard to do a good experiment, but other times it's not necessarily so hard. And that it almost seems like they're not really the powers to be aren't trying to do good science. They aren't trying to like purify their experiments so they get a good result. Because that's what, you know, after reading this and you just kind of know about you know, the proper method to try to figure something out that they're really making no attempt 
And even when you read these things, it seems the same thing. I mean, you read it and go, what are you talking about? You know, it, it's just like, this isn't a good experiment. And you're like, it's like hearsay and like crazy things, you know, you like you read it and then they publish it and then they'll contradict themselves in like the same article, like the WHO or CDC in the beginning, they'll say something and then three paragraphs down, they'll say the exact opposite thing. And so it, it's, it's really kind of frustrating to, to read this stuff. Okay, Kurt, but you were going to talk a little bit about the Google situation, right? All right, Google. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I mean, specifically, uh, it had to do with the, uh, the president just invoked his economic powers that he has and uh, signed an executive order banning TikTok, T-I-K-T-O-K, -K, which is a Chinese application app company that's been very popular in a lot of the world. And it's basically, it's a video sharing device for folks that aren't up on their apps these days. Uh, so in oh, terms of, in trying, terms to of trying to post something yeah. that they wanna show to other people in mass, if folks are familiar with YouTube, it's something similar to that. So if you film yourself doing something and you wanna share it with a lot of people, you put it on this app through, you send it into the, uh, you know, the blogosphere through this TikTok app, which you can download on your phone or your computer or, uh, you know, any other kind of device. Now, the objection that the president uh, stated, as well as a lot of national security officers in this country, is that when you put that application on your phone, if we want to use that as an, as an example, what that device is a what happens is that the application sucks information out of your device again whether it's a phone or computer laptop whatever it is and uh it stores that information the information such as location where mm -hmm. places that you've been when you were using your phone uh, as well as websites that you have browsed uh and it stores that and the fear is that that information then, because TikTok is owned by, TikTok is a subsidiary of a company that's owned by a, a Chinese firm, that that information can be shared with the Chinese government. And uh, the thinking is that if that happens, people that are in security positions in this country and sensitive positions, as well as in big business, they could be blackmailed because the Chinese government can use that if they develop a dossier on a person and have a history of the types of things that they're looking at on the internet, the types of things that they're doing on the internet and places that they're traveling to, uh, that they can potentially be used uh, as blackmail against you know, people of power in this country, uh, whether it's in government or in business. And that gives the upper hand to the Chinese government. Now. That being said, uh, Google, Apple, as well as a couple of other companies have the same exact ability to do that, but they're American companies. Right. They're not right. Chinese companies. So the fear is that the Chinese Communist Party uh, has a great deal of authority over Chinese companies and that they can make a discovery request and demand that TikTok turn over this information to their central committee and uh, then that can be used for intelligence services. So it's kind of amazing that you know, these companies can actually have that kind of uh, power uh, and actually get into your brain and see what you've been doing, what you've been purchasing, what you've been buying, uh, and the types of things that you've been doing. And see, and Are you really surprised? I'm not at all surprised. By what I'm part not. of it? I'm not surprised because Google and all those companies also censor stuff all the time. Yeah. I mean, they, they censored the president the other day, didn't they? I mean, right. they well, have... but I mean, we're in this big brother society yeah. that's yeah, right. not necessarily government controlled. It's, it's, right. it's con controlled by the controlled by big, big businesses. Right. Exactly. But in this instance, you know, uh, the, the curb is, you know, that they want to put is on the Chinese government right. being able to do that. And then, in addition to TikTok, there's a, a, a company called WeChat, W-E-Chat. It's also a Chinese company. And 
right. what the fear is is that that company has the ability to track Chinese nationals that are visiting the United States and see what they've been up to. Uh, and that that would be reported back to the Chinese government. And the premise uh, for banning that company, and by banning, basically, American advertisers cannot place advertisements and, and conduct any kind of commerce with either WeChat or TikTok, which would essentially bleed those companies, financially speaking. And so the president's asked that the, uh, that the assets of TikTok, if, if that company is to continue existing uh, and that application continues to exist in the United States, that they would have to sell, TikTok would have to sell all of its, all of its US assets as well as storage facilities to an American-based company so that, so that they can spy on everyone. And the government yeah. would get a big yeah. cut. Correct. The finders. In, in the process, yeah. <laughs> Well, they've already, I mean, I agree, those companies have enormous control over us. Yeah. Whether it's TikTok, which I don't like, but I don't like the fact that Google and all those other companies have equal control over us. They're That's doing been the one same of the thing. results of the pandemic. That's given them that kind of enormous power and the power to censor. Well, the power was already I, there. It's just yeah, been, I know. you know, accelerated uh, right. during the course of the pandemic. Right. I just want to mention before, I'm sorry, Pete, go ahead. We don't have a whole lot of time left. Something about the censoring thing, which I sent to Sandy the other day. So I've been trying to get something published in Vermont Digger, and I've written a couple of things, and then I wrote something the other day, basically just questioning the testing for COVID and, and the contradictory things that I'm reading with the CDC and the WHO, and I footnoted it with articles from the CDC, WHO, and the lady from Vermont Digger wrote back, Sorry, we will not be publishing your piece because it not, does not adhere to the COVID publishing guidelines. Right. That <laughs> happens on YouTube, too. Remember that? Said, there were two wow. doctors. So I, I, wrote back and said, I wrote back and said, what are the COVID publishing guidelines? And she never responded. Right. Well, I, I yeah. doubt if she will. Anyway, any final thoughts? One of the things, though, that I really find troubling the most about the epidemic and the pandemic and the way that it has been treated is the absolute shutdown of our many of our political institutions, including the fact that City Hall is still locked down. There's still no way to get into City Hall. Can't do a protest in City Hall. Um, the libraries are still shut. Bars are open. Libraries are not um, and, and that fact that the libraries are shut down, City Hall is shut down, they're making plans to do the legislature remotely. I don't really get it. Those are our political institutions. They, are, they should be open and uh, available and accessible to all Vermonters and to all Americans. And I wanna remind people that we have lost that ability to watch our government in action and also have any kind of input, especially into City Hall, and that's Burlington. Well, that's and not that true. is I mean, that is because of the epidemic. That is not true, Sandy. You can uh, watch all the city uh, council meetings no, and Zoom. participate in them on Zoom. No, it's not the you same. You cannot, thing. Mark. That is not correct. I'm going to interrupt you. You have to have a computer. Right now, I don't have a computer that even works on Zoom. So think about all the people who don't have one at all. How, okay. what's, what is the overlap of that group with the what people group? who use the people who don't have computers with the people who actually come to City Hall? I think that's a topic that we should study. We should study how many people are on Zoom. Okay. And I would guess it's a lot fewer than that used to go to City Hall. The week before this happened, there were 200 people in City Hall at a public forum protesting against some kind of a resolution that was going to be passed concerning migrant justice. 200 people who will not ever at this point be able to get into City Hall again unless we make ago, that demand. A couple of weeks ago, the discussion, the public discussion I know that. in right. the City Hall, uh, in the City Council went on right. for two nights with, I, know. I forget how many, but like 300 to I do know how many. How there many? were a thousand people who called in. All right, so I know that are. because it was completely organized by people who are able to organize social media. Fine, that was good of them. That was good of them. 
I'm arguing that City Hall should be open and people like us that pay taxes for City Hall should be allowed to go there and protest in person. Anyway, that's my argument. Think about it. But anybody else have any final comments? And I want the libraries open. I've told you that, Ian, a number of times, right? Okay, so a couple weeks, we might be back. Yes, no, maybe what? Sure. Okay. All right. So see you. Thank you all very much. And